Good evening. Sorry for missing last week, but with my pretty severe summer cold, I was, re I was really not um, good company. We're back this week. We're looking at the book of Exodus again. We've been looking at Moses going. That's why I'm calling this study, Mo, gotta go. Moses was always on the move. This week, we're actually going to take a pause in the action and, and see the reasons for the move. Uh, this week, I want us to, to stop literally in the, in the middle of the stream, in the middle of the exodus from Egypt, and look back at what's happened and, and look to kind of the other side of the stream. Moses and the exodus from Egypt presents for us a a vivid picture of something that actually does not happen for a long time after that event. 1,400 years before Jesus died on the cross as our Passover lamb, the Lord presented a picture of that sacrifice. So let's look back to that day. So turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to read one verse from where we were last time and then pick up and read through verse 41. Verse 33 through 41 of Exodus chapter 12. The Egyptians were urgent with the people of the Hebrew people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses had told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides the women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years, at the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. The people of Israel, God had made a way for these Hebrew people to be set free from their slavery, freed from their oppression. They were not only free, they were sent away the Egyptian people from Pharaoh down to the local farmers all wanted the Hebrew people to leave. We saw earlier in verse 30 that there was not a household in Egypt that did not suffer loss on the night of that 10th and final plague. The people of Israel are saved not because the Egyptians suffered loss, but because the Egyptians feared greater loss. If God, the God of the Hebrew people, we would know him as the Old Testament God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If, if God could reach the firstborn of Egypt, what would he do next? The Egyptians said, we shall all be dead. But the motivation of the Egyptians is not the significant picture that we need to see in this passage. The significant picture is the release of the slaves. God worked those miracles in order for the Israelite slaves to be freed. The condition of Israel, their condition before their release, is for us a representation of the general human condition. The Hebrews were God's people. Under God's leadership, they moved from the land of Canaan 
to Egypt due to a severe famine. And I've often wondered if there was not at some point, um, if they weren't at some point disobedient to a continued leadership of the Lord by staying in Egypt. Now, certainly God had provided for them by sending Joseph, who under the Lord's leadership became the prime minister and then wisely stored ample food for the time of the famine, not only for Egypt, but more than enough also to include his family. But, but I wonder, is there an unspoken person? Is there a, a leader that God appointed to bring the people out and, and that leader refused? Or, or was there um, a move on the part of the people to refuse any leadership which might have brought them out prior to the 430 years? Perhaps there was. Perhaps they were so totally entrenched in their slavery so they might become symbolic of our slavery to sin. Think about this. They were abused. They were, they were beaten. They were taken advantage of. Yet when times got hard during the journey to the promised land, they longed to be back in Egypt. Why? Because they were comfortable being slaves. That's what 430 years does for you. That's what being totally immersed in the world looks like for us. We might know that our habits are bad. We might understand that our path is destructive. We might even know that what we do regularly is sin, but we do it anyway. We continue in our bad habits, our sins, because we're used to it. We're comfortable with them. We've been a slave to sin for so long that that's the only life that we know. Jesus said in John 8, 34, Truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The people of Israel were released by the miraculous acts of God. It wasn't the benevolence of Pharaoh or the generosity of the Egyptian people. God had to devastate Egypt in order for the hearts of the Egyptians to be changed. The Egyptian people had to the com come to the point of fearing for their own lives before they would agree to send Israel away so completely. What, what Moses had asked for was that the people might go three days' journey to worship and to serve the Lord. Now, the assumption is that from that experience, God would arrange their complete release. But that request was rejected by Pharaoh over and over again. And, and after the night of the Passover, they were sent out of Egypt without condition. They were set free. It was an extreme change of their conditions. In the same way, it's an extreme change of our condition which moves us from being a slave to sin to being set free. The release of the Hebrew people from slavery came after death. The death of a lamb whose blood was used to mark the doors of the Hebrew homes and the death of the firstborn of Egypt. Our release from slavery also comes after death. The, the death of God's son, Jesus, and the shedding of his blood for us to be set free. Moses is often called the deliverer of Israel. But Moses did not sacrifice his life in exchange for theirs. But Jesus did that for us. Jesus gave his life so that we might be set free from sin. <clears throat> Excuse me. John chapter 8 verse 36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That is, you will be free completely, completely free. In that way, Jesus is our 
Passover lamb. He is the firstborn. That is, he's the principal and chief relation of God who died so that we might be set free. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming down the bank toward the waters of the Jordan River, John made this declaration, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29. It was because of a lamb that the Hebrew people were saved from death. That death was a physical death. They were saved from a physical death. Because of the Lamb of God, we're saved, not from physical death, but from spiritual death. Jesus was the Lamb. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, we see this spelled out specifically for Christ Jesus. Our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed. Now, let me read that again. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ, our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed. The night of the Passover, the terrible night where the firstborn of Egypt perished was for Israel a night of salvation. It was also a night of provision. In the future, after that night, the, the people of Israel are going to need some wealth. They're going to need it for the purchase of things that they need, uh, it, they're going to need it to equip their homes and their lands. Uh, they're also going to need some of this wealth to be able to use that for the ornamentation, for the building of the tabernacle and the implements of worship. They're going to need gold and silver to make those things. God provided those things from the Egyptians, the, the wealth, the physical gold and silver of Egypt was given to the Hebrew people for their use as a way of, of getting rid of them. It, it's as if the Egyptians were saying, leave, leave, wait, 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 you're slaves. You're going to need money. Here, take mine and go. This is, this is a fulfillment, not only of what was told to Moses, this was something God had promised to Abraham. In Genesis 15, all the way back in the book of Genesis, verses 13 and 14, the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offsprings will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants, slaves there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. And then God said, But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. God provided Israel with everything they would need to live and to serve him. Christ does the same thing for us. When we are redeemed, when we are freed from the bondage to sin, we have provisions. We're giving provisions for life and for service also. Now, ours is not gold and silver jewelry. It's not, it's not physical provisions in that way always, but it is spiritual provisions. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God that is ours after we're saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which, with which he loved us even when we were dead, in our trespasses, even when we were slaves to sin, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and has raised us up with him, has freed us and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God provided through miracle and from the Egyptian people what the Hebrew would need, what the Hebrew people would need for their freedom, in their freedom. Through Jesus, God has 
done the same thing for us. So Jesus is our Passover lamb. He was sacrificed for us. His blood was shed so that we might be saved from our slavery to sin. And then he provides for us all that we need in the person of the Holy Spirit as well as in his love and grace for the future. He provides for us all that we need to be able to live in our new relationship with him. God worked miracles to free the people and provide for them. And God sent a miracle in Jesus to free us and to provide for us all that we need. Jesus did that for you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this look into your word. We see, Father, a, a snapshot, a picture of, of your grace, of your love, and of your mercy. We, we lift this out and, and hold it up as a lens, and through this lens, we can see forward into the future 1,400 years to the life of Jesus, how he became the, the perfect, spotless lamb, how his blood was shed so that our sins might be covered, paid for, that his life was, was spent for us as a sacrifice and how even today he's in heaven interceding for us, providing for us all that we need for life and for relationship with you. Thank you for Jesus. Help us to live our lives reflecting that plan that you showed us in the Hebrews being free from Egypt and that you gave us in Jesus and that you provide for us today. Lord, help us to live in that, to share that with others, that if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for friends that are suffering right now, for those that are going through chemo. Uh, we pray for a young man that's related to our somebody in our church that begins a very gruesome uh, chemo regiment for the next eight months very shortly. And we pray for, for him. We pray, Father, for your grace to be abundant, for them to be provided all that they need to be able to get through, to survive, to thrive, even in the midst of these things. We pray, Father, for our church and our community. Uh, we don't understand what's going on right now. The politics is so upsetting and the, the COVID seems like it's resurging. And, and Father, we, we pray that you would help us to draw near to you, to be faithful to you, even in the midst of these things, that we can, in turn, be able to offer hope and encouragement to others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday.